In the 1930s, under the school's collection of folklore, Bernard McGowan of Kinloch speaks with local man Owen Meehan, aged 76, and writes. On the southern shore of Loch Melvin are the ruins of Rossclaw Castle and Church. Their ruins, side by side, form a striking memorial of the heroic deeds and pious labours in the days when the McClancy's of Dartry fought for the lands their souls adored. Rossclaher Castle stands on a rocky cranog of a circular shape about 40 feet in diameter and less than 30 yards from the shore. Unfortunately, time's iron hand has dealt so rudely with the castle that only detached portions of it remain, but even these are majestic and picturesque enough to give an idea of what must have been the strength and beauty of this castle in its good days. The masonry was of a peculiar, durable character when one sees the large and well-cut stones, the thick walls, and causes to try his power in demolishing the extremely hard and durable mortar, he understands how Rossclaher Castle has withstood so well the western storms for over six centuries, and for several times rolled back the tide of war. Local tradition has it that when at one time smallpox was ravaging the district, McClancy, becoming alarmed for the safety of his daughter, got this castle built in from the mainland that she might be safe from all the infection. The disease reached her, however, even inside the strong walls of Roscohar, and she died. Such is the legend, but it cannot be regarded as fact, for it is added to the story that the family castle stood on the adjoining shore, but no such traces appear and it is not probable that the chief castle of the district would leave no traces of itself behind, for a castle built for the alleged purposes leaves imposing remains. Besides, the castle on the Cranog is mentioned in her annals as the scene of many a sturdy fight. The ancient territory of Dartry corresponded nearby with the present barony of Roscohar. Its hereditary chief was the Maclancy, the Irish form of whose name is Macflanica. In 1641 they were completely conquered and it was then that they lost the Mac. Since then they are called Clancy. There are only a few of this name now in the district, one in Kinloch, on the southern shore of Loch Melvin, and a few in Gortnasilla. It is locally believed that when a Clancy dies, a bit falls from the Blue Rock, a mountain overlooking the ancient territory of McClancy. Well, we're on the southern shore of Loch Melvin. We're not too far from the village of Kinlaw in North Leitrim. Uh, we're, behind me is Rossclaher Castle, also known as McClancy's Castle. And that was the stronghold of the McClancy clan in the, the late medieval period and early modern era up to the 16th, 17th century. In terms of who the McClancy's were, they seem to have descended from an early medieval group known as the Colrigi, but certainly by the 11th or 12th century uh, they would have adopted the surname McClancy. The first actual reference to the McClancy's come in 1221 when we hear of Carnach Rivach McClancy um, actually I think dying, okay, an obit. And then again we hear of I think Donal McClancy dying in 1241 and he's called the Lord of Dartry which is this area uh, to the south of Loch Melvin, very mountainous area, but also with good farmland uh, beside uh, the lake. But anyway, the McClancy's 
this was their centre during the the what we call a canoich or head place in Latin caput uh, of the McClancy lordship of uh, Dartry during this whole period. The McClancy's were a noble Gaelic family uh, uh, um, of minor uh, standing within the Gaelic kingdom of West Breffney. Uh, they would have been an important supporter of the O'Rourke clan or a sub vassal of the O'Rourke clan. They, their territory, the territory of the McClancy's, would have comprised what is today the, the barony of Rosclaher. Um, the, the land uh, around Kinla, Glenade Valley, over towards Ross Inver, uh, and over nearly as far as Manor Hamilton, the, the modern town of Manor Hamilton today. So what's actually here in terms of archaeology? Well, there's quite a little complex here. First of all, offshore we have a Cranog, an artificial island fortress. On the Cranog, we have a tower house, probably of 15th century date. And then onshore, we have a dry land residence, probably linked to the McClancy's as well, in the form of a univalet ring fort. And also, there is one historical reference to some sort of nucleated village settlement here, probably a scattering of houses, servants and soldiers and labourers working for the McClancy's uh, during this whole period. And of course, they need services. And one of the services, of course, would have been spiritual services. And we have behind us there a chapel of ease, probably built in the 13th, 14th century, which serves the community. We're actually within the medieval parish of Ross Inver, but that's quite a distance away. So if there's a little, as I say, McClancy centre here with people congregated here, the McClancy's and their servants and armed retainers, they would have need, needed somewhere to worship. Well, again, you know, the uh, Cranog here, artificial island fortress, has not been excavated, nor have we carried out radiocarbon or dendrochronology dating of any of the timbers associated with it. But on analogy with elsewhere, I would say that the Cranog was built maybe in the 5th, 6th, 7th century AD. And, it, and from what we can see, both here at Rosclaher and also in other parts of Gaelic dominated parts of Ireland, seems to have been inhabited down until the 15th century, when a tower house was then built on the Cranog. Now, why do we think that tower house, which is a form of castle, probably three to five stories in height originally, so it would have been much taller than it is now. Why do we think that tower house was built by the McClancy's tower house castle in the 15th century? Well, there's a reference to it in 1421. And again, on analogy with elsewhere, in terms of uh, architectural dating, but also radiocarbon dating of twigs uh, in the, um, in the makeup uh, of the Cranog, Gaelic lords in this part of the world start to build tower houses in quite a lot of numbers around the year 1400 or so. So that reference in 1421 fits into that early 15th century. So what we have here is a Cranog, uh, probably built in the early medieval period, say 6th, 7th century, occupied by, we'll say, the Calrogi or the Dartrogi, early medieval population group, ancestors, if you like, of the McClancy's um, uh, clan at a later date, um, living on that Cranog. And then, as time went on, the McClancy's use it occupy it from the 11th, 12th century, 13th century, 14th century as a Cranog. And what would it have looked like at that stage? Well, a wooden palisade around the uh, edge of the Cranog, which is about 20 meters in diameter, and probably some form of wooden house, maybe post and wattle house within the Cranog itself. And then, as I say, at a later date, the tower house in the early 15th century is built on top of the Cranog. Uh, maybe it could be up to four or five stories in height orig originally. The other thing about the um, 
complex is remember that these aren't just fortresses. They're also the centers of lordships, uh, the centers of basically a domain farm. And obviously it's hard to administer and farm from a Cranog. So we find very often that there's a dry land site with administrative and farm buildings linked to, we'll say in this example, the farmed estate of the McClancy's. And in my opinion, again on an algae elsewhere, that's the ring fort just up about 100 metres uh, uh, away from us, uphill overlooking the uh, Cranog. So there's quite a little complex here. The McClancy clan had two principal strongholds uh, during this time, here at Rusclaher, this castle in the lake, and also a, a second uh, stronghold out on the coast uh, where Tullahan is now. It would have been Duncarbury Castle. Those were the two principal castles that, that the, uh, the McClancy's had. There was a number of functions being performed here you had the, the political stronghold, the administrative centre for the, the lordship and also had you, ha you have the religious aspect with the church and that church, while that's possibly 15th century as well as, as the stone castle, that sits on an, an older site that perhaps goes back maybe even as far as the 8th century. Um, the, the early annals refer to it as Dera Mella. Mella's Oak Grove, it was a female saint that is associated with that location and it's believed that the McClancy Church sits on that site, that, surrounded by an enclosure. Other things about the, um, uh, the, the archaeology here is that the church is quite interesting because there's a window on its western gable looking into the church. Now, what does that mean? Well, it would seem to me that there probably was a timber, wooden priest's residence on, attached to the eastern gable. And that's why we're seeing a window looking into the church. People sometimes look upon this period as being a very uh, violent, you know, a lot of violent, a lot of conflict. For, but most of the period, say most of the 15th and 16th century, while the McClancy's were residing in that castle, there wouldn't have been that much violent conflict uh, across 150, 200 years. There would have been sporadic outbreaks of, of war, and particularly at the end of the, the 16th century, as the crown, the British, the English crown, extended its authority across the, the, the country and into the northwest. It became very fractious and violent then. But for most of the time, McClancy's lived in a, in a fairly peaceful, relatively harmonious uh, uh, existence with their surrounding neighbours, the O'Connors, uh, Sligo O'Connors out on, on the coast, the, the O'Donnells uh, and the O'Gallaghers to the north, the O'Gallaghers would have been a Belik, and of course the O'Rourkes to the southeast over in Drumahair, centred around Drumahair and Glencar and, and North Leitrim generally. While most of the time there was, it was relatively peaceful, the site chosen for the centre of the, the, the lordship by the McClancy's, the, there were defensive considerations take, you know, taken into consideration for this spot. It is secluded, it's away from the main coastal stretch which would have been more prone to, to conflict as the, the, the O'Donnells of Tyrconnell and the O'Connors of Sligo fought for possession and control of that really important coastal stretch. But in here, uh, on the western side of, of Loch Melvin, there was very, it was very marshy, so that protected the western side. You, uh, you, the northern side of the settlement, of course, is protected by the, the, the large lake, so anybody approaching from the north have to get across this bo body of water, and the McClancy's, when they were threatened, tended to bring their herds of cattle, their people, their retainers, and whatever they could carry up into the Dartry Mountains, where it would have been much more difficult for a hostile force to, to, to get at them there, and then th there's nothing really for them to hold 
here and when the danger passed then they could return and of course we have a very vivid description of that from 1588 where the McClancy's did flee because they believed that they were going to be attacked by crown troops maybe a force about 1500 1800 under the the, the command of the lord deputy sir william fitzwilliam who uh, was mounting an expedition into the northwest, which coincided with the what we would call the Armada crisis of, of the autumn of 1588. We also know a lot about this site because Francisco de Cuellar, the Spanish uh, captain who was shipwrecked at Strida Strand, makes his way here in the winter of 1588 looking for sanctuary, if you like, from the McClancy's, who were in uh, rebellion, where they weren't in outright rebellion at that stage, they were a couple of years later. But let's put it this way, they weren't happy with English rule in this part uh, of, of Ireland. So we know from one of the Spanish survivors, Captain Francisco de Cuello, who was given refuge here along with maybe eight or nine, ten others at that time, this would be November, December of 1588, that McClancy got word reached the village here that there was a, a, an English force well, out on, on the coast. We know that Fitzwilliam was at Ballyshannon, so from there it's only six, eight kilometres uh, from the lake. So rather than wait, McClancy took the decision to go into the mountains and, and C Captain Cuellar describes how he decided to stay in the castle with his Spanish mates and he claimed to defend it against the English forces. Captain Cuellar, of course, he was a Spanish captain of a, of a Spanish galleon that participated in the famous Spanish Armada of 1588. Now, the purpose of that Spanish Armada was to invade England. Now, that attempt to invade England failed. Once they were frustrated of their intentions, the, the commander of the fleet who had sailed from Lisbon in July of, of 1588, he took the decision to return to Spain. But the winds were against them. These were sailing vessels. So the winds were coming from the south and pushing the fleet north into the North Sea and, and that way. So rather than try and sail against against the wind and, and face the English fleet for a second time, they took the decision to sail around Scotland, around Ireland, out into the Atlantic and back to Spain by that route. They were very unlucky. As they rounded Ireland and as they rounded Scotland indeed, they, they began to run into heavy uh, Atlantic storms. So Captain Cuellar was uh, by, by now was on the ship called the Lavia. He had been arrested and court-martialed and sent uh, as a prisoner to the ship the Lavia, where the, the judge advocate general of the fleet was. Uh, that ship and two others sailed together for mutual support as they got into difficulty in these storms and became isolated from the rest of the fleet. And of course, those three ships were wrecked at Strida Strand in County Sligo. It was about another one of about 14 ships that were wrecked by that storm on that day. Um, Quellier fortunately survived. There was about 900 or so people spread across those three ships. About 300 survived that storm and made it ashore. Roughly, maybe half of those were ex rounded up and executed by the Sheriff of Sligo, who was George Bingham. He would have been a brother of the infamous Richard Bingham, who was the governor of Connacht at this time. Quellier avoided being captured by Crown troops and he was directed inland to, Brian, to the lands of Brian O'Rourke. Uh, he made his way to Drumahair and then got word that there was a ship on the coast that was collecting survivors now. That ship would have been the Girona at Killybegs that subsequently got wrecked up near uh, the Giant's Causeway towards the end of October 1588. He was trying to make his way to that ship. Not, he wasn't sure where he was. He got lost in the glens of North Leitrim and he ultimately uh, ended up at Ross Clogher and he was taken in by the people there. At that time, he says there was 10 others when he arrived, 10 other Spanish survivors when he arrived. And uh, he was looked after by the, the people here and, and shown very good kindness. He, he says in his account that while we were robbed when we were first shipwrecked, if it wasn't for the people 
caring for us as they would their own, none of us would have survived. Going along, lost with much uncertainty and toil, I met by chance with a road, along with a clergyman, and he directed me by the right road that I should go to reach a castle, which was six leagues from there. It was very strong and belonged to a savage gentleman, a very brave soldier and a great enemy of the Queen of England and of her affairs. A man who had never cared to obey her or to pay her any tribute, attending only to his castle and mountains, which made it strong. When Mark Clancy saw me so stripped of clothing and covered with straw, he and all those who were with him grieved greatly, and their woman even wept to see me so badly treated. They helped me as best they could with a blanket, the kind that they used themselves, and I remained there for three months, acting as a real savage, like themselves. These people called themselves Christians. Mass is said among them, and regulated according to the orders of the Church of Roma. The great majority of their churches, monasteries, and hermitages have been demolished by the hands of the English, who are in a garrison, and of those natives who have joined them, are as bad as they. In short, in this kingdom, there is neither justice nor right, and everyone does what he pleases. As to ourselves, these savages, they liked us, well, because they knew we came against to oppose the heretics, and were such great enemies of theirs, if it had not been for those who guarded us as their own persons, not one of us would have been left alive. He was very generous in his description of the people here. And of course, he gives a very vivid account of life in the village. He, he describes lounging around in the kind of the winter sunshine uh, at some point with the locals and, and telling their fortunes, because of course, he was a very exotic uh, individual to, uh, to, to the locals here who would never have seen a Spaniard before. The wife of my master was very beautiful in the extreme, and she showed me much kindness. One day, we were sitting in the sun with some of her female friends and relatives. They asked me about Spanish matters and other parts, and in the end, it came to be suggested that I should examine their hands and tell them their fortunes, giving thanks to God that it had not gone even worse with me than to be a gypsy among the savages. I began to look at the hands of each and to say to them a hundred thousand absurdities which pleased them so much that there were no other Spaniard better than I or that was in greater favour with them. The custom of these savages is to live as the brute beasts among the mountains which are very rugged in that part of Ireland where we lost ourselves. They live in huts made of straw the men are all large-bodied and of handsome features and limbs and as active as the roe deer. They do not eat oftener than once a day, and this is at night. And that which they usually eat is butter with oaten bread. They drink sour milk, for they have no other drink, and they don't drink water, although it is the best in the world. On feast days, they eat some flesh, half-cooked, without bread or salt, as that is their custom. They clothe themselves according to their habit, with tight trousers and short loose coats of very coarse goat's hair. They cover themselves with blankets and wear their hair down to their eyes. They are great walkers and inured to toil. They carry on perpetual war with the English, who here keep a garrison for the queen, from whom they defend themselves and do not let them enter their territory. They sleep upon the ground, on rushes, newly cut and full of water and ice. The most of the women are very beautiful, but badly dressed. They do not wear more than a chemise, a blanket with which they cover themselves, and a linen cloth, much doubled, over their head and tied in the front. They are great workers and housekeepers after their fashion. So the McClancy's are sheltering, the McClancy chief or lord is sheltering the Quellyar. And he talks about the site here. He mentions a, a town, which I would think is some sort of scatter of 
post and wattle houses, maybe 10 or 15, as I think I said earlier, lived in by the retainers and, and um, labourers uh, of the McClancy's. But de Quellar also decides on the, on, at, at, upon the advance of a, what we would call an English army, but it clearly had Irish soldiers within it as well, um, he decides to actually defend the castle with, I think, eight to ten of his Spanish comrades. McClancy, following Irish tradition, actually uh, goes with his cattle and his non-combatants and his men, if you like, into the mountains. He won't stand and defend um, a, a set piece of, of ground. And this was a very efficient Gaelic Irish way of actually defending territory against attack. You hide your cattle uh, away in the mountains, you hide your non-combatants, and then you use the landscape uh, to bring uh, English forces or, or invading forces to battle. But de Quelliard feels, no, I'm going to actually defend the castle against attack with about eight to ten, I can't actually remember, eight to ten Spanish uh, soldiers. And they do do this successfully. They defend, defend against the uh, 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 Crown forces for, uh, for about 17 days. Word of our survival reached to the great governor of the Queen, who was in the city of Dublin. And he went immediately with 700 soldiers to search for the lost ships and the people who had escaped. From then, he turned off towards the castle of McClancy, for so was called the savage chief with whom I was, who was always a great enemy of the queen and never loved anything of hers nor cared to obey her. For this reason, the governor was very anxious to take him prisoner. This savage chief, taking into consideration the great force that was now coming against him and that he could not resist it, decided to fly to the mountains, which was his only remedy. More he could not do. We Spaniards who were with him had news of the misfortune that was coming upon us. We did not know what to do or where to place ourselves in safety. One Sunday after Mass, the chief, with his dishevelled hair down to his eyes, took us apart and burning with rage, he said he could not remain and he decided to fly with all his villagers and their cattle and their families and that we should settle what we wanted to do to save our lives. I replied to him to calm a little and that presently we would give him an answer. I went apart with the eight Spaniards who were with me. They were good fellows and I told them we now will consider all of our past misfortunes and that which was coming now upon us and in order not to see ourselves in more misfortune it was better to make an end of it at once honourably and as we had then a good opportunity, we should not wait any longer, nor wander about, flying to the mountains and woods, naked and barefooted, with such great cold as there was. Besides, as the savage chief regretted so much to abandon his castle, we, the nine Spaniards who were there, would cheerfully remain in it and defend it to the death. And this we could do very well, because the castle is very strong and very difficult to take even if they should attack it with artillery, for it is founded on a lake of very deep water. Neither could injury be done to it, because for a league around the town, which was established on the mainland, it is marshy, breast deep, so that even the inhabitants, the natives, could not get to it, except by paths. Then, considering all this carefully, we decided to say to the savage king, we wish to hold the castle and defend it to the death. And that he should, with much speed, lay now the provisions for six months and some arms. Oh, the savage chief, he was so pleased with this and to see our courage that he did not delay to make all provision and to ensure that we should not act falsely, he made us to swear that we would not abandon his castle nor surrender it to the enemy for any bargain or agreement, even if we should perish from hunger, and not to open the gates for Irishmen, Spaniards, or anyone else until his return, which he would doubtless accomplish. Then, all that was necessary being well prepared, we moved into the castle. 
with the ornaments and requisites for church service and some relics which there were, we placed three or four boatloads of stones within and six muskets with six crossbows and other arms. Then the savage chief, embracing us, retired to the mountains, and all his people having already gone there. And the report was spread throughout the country that MacClancy's castle was put in a state of defense and it would not be surrendered to the enemy because a Spanish captain with other Spaniards were within, guarded it and held it. Our courage seemed good to the whole country of Ireland, and the enemy was very indignant about it, and came upon the castle with his forces, about 1,800 men, and observed us from a distance of a mile and a half, without being able to approach closer on account of the water. From there, he exhibited some warnings. He hanged two Spaniards and did other damages, injuries to put us in fear. We had been besieged by them for... Seventeen days, when our Lord, O Sdia, Lord saw it fit to succour and deliver us from the enemy by severe storms and great falls of snow, which took place to such an extent that the Queen's governor was compelled to depart with his force and march back to Dublin. the chief of the castle, when he heard the news that the Englishman had retired, well, he returned to his town and castle, greatly appeased and calmed. They gifted us much. He, the chief, very earnestly admitted to us to full privileges and most loyal friends, offering us whatever was his for our service. To me, he would give a sister of his that I should marry her. I thanked him very much for this, but I contented myself with a guide to direct me to a place where I could meet quickly with embarkation for Scotland. He did not wish to give me permission to leave, nor any Spaniard who were with him, saying that the roads were not safe, but his sole object was now to detain us, that we might act as his guard. So much friendship did not appear good to me, and thus I decided secretly with four other of the soldiers who were in my company, to depart one morning, two hours before the dawn. Tyg McClancy was here in the late 1580s. He had claimed the chieftaincy of of, of, Ross Clower in 1582. Now, his reign lasted until 1590. Uh, the, the, The Armada crisis provoked uprisings and rebellions in Connacht through 1589 into 1590. There was a big clampdown in 1590 in Leitrim. Uh, Leitrim was actually devastated in in April of of 1590. O'Rourke, of course, was a a problem child, shall we say, in North Connacht for the Crown authorities. He was quite rebellious. He was very suspicious of, of any kind of interference by Bingham or by Crown officials in his territory. So he rose, as did other clans in Connacht in 1589 and remained in revolt into 1590, at which time Fitzwilliam and Bingham decide, right, we're going to crush O'Rourke, he's just too problematic. And four separate forces entered the county from the south and from the north and and ravaged the the, the county. Uh, O'Rourke didn't have 
the strength to match them and he had to flee. He would have come up for, through Drumahair, probably the eastern end of uh, uh, Loch Melvin, as he fled for Cheer Connell and, and he was given refuge up in Cheer Connell. Uh, Tig McClancy was with him, but he, at some point he, re, he, has re, he returns to, to Ross Clower where he was ambushed by a rival McClancy who was loyal to the Crown, who had led the Crown forces from the coast into to Ross Clower. And we have quite a vivid description of McClancy running down, for the, down, da, down the field for the lake, getting into the lake, but getting shot. And he wasn't killed outright by that shot. He was dragged ashore and then beheaded. And his head was sent to Bingham as evidence, right? We got, we've got him. So Malachlan McClancy was, shall we call him, the Queen's McClancy who then took control of Ross Clare and he remained in power here till the end of the Nine Years' War, which, which ended around 1603. Um, his son inherited the lordship, but then 20 years later, we have the plantation of Leitrim taking place. Now, the McClancy lost some of their land, a good scatter of land was given to new settlers, uh, at, during this period. But the McClancy's were still here, most likely still occupying the castle into the 1640s. And during the 1640s, from 1641 on, there, there, was, there was a major uprising, uh, really in reaction to the plantation period and the loss of status, the loss of power that the Gaelic families, who previously reigned supreme uh, in Ireland, it, it, was, a, it was a backlash. Um, we know that the, the McClancy's were active in that rebellion. By now, Manor Hamilton had been founded by Sir Frederick Hamilton, who was a Scottish planter. And that became a focus of attacks 1641 through to 1642. And we know that McClancy's were involved. We also know that, that some of them were captured and executed by Hamilton. Now they remained possibly in revolt into the 1650s, but when that was suppressed, then they lost their land and, and the land was given to another Scottish individual at that point and we kind of date the down the final downfall of the McClancy lordship of Rosclaw really to the 1650s and this castle then falls into disuse and is really not used again.